Welcome to Hispanic Biz Success Stories. We gather stories of successful entrepreneurs to learn their stories in hopes that you find them entertaining and enjoyable. Today, we're very fortunate to have with us a gentleman who has an intriguing business, Mr. Roberto Barrio of Crazy Cat Cyclery. Mr. Barrio, thank you so much for taking time to let thank us gather your story. Thank you for having me, Mr. Alicia. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Barrio, tell me, what is Crazy Cat Cyclery? I like to think of Crazy Cat Cyclery as a community bike shop that is vested in the well-being and wellness of, of the citizens of El Paso. How long have you been in business? We just had our 20th anniversary in November of 2015. Wow. And how many stores do you have? I have three locations, and um, they're spread out around the city, and uh, we're very happy with where we're at. So you've been part of the growth of cycling in, in the El Paso region. I like to think that um, we've been a part of contributing to the growth of cycling, but it's certainly been the efforts of, of many avid uh, cyclists that have helped to grow that community. How did you get into cyclery? As a child, uh, just I think like any uh, young child, it's y you, you always want to have a bicycle. And then I think I was just attracted to the simplicity of the bike and the freedom of the bike. and. I never, I never let go of that love for the bicycle. So uh, 20 years ago, you decided to open up a store? Yeah, it was really funny because um, I was working with my father and we had a successful business, a great relationship. And then I thought, what do I want to be doing 20 years from now? And the thing that I loved the most was riding my bike. So I thought I would get involved in something related to cycling. Uh, interesting. Well, as we get into that, let me ask you, you were born uh, in, in the region, you were born here in El Paso? Yeah, I was born in El Paso in 1960, and I was here until I was three years old, and then my father moved to the Ventura Oxnard area of California to work in the fields there as a bracero. So your father worked the fields in California, and your mother, housewife? Or housewife her whole life, yeah, very supportive. You know, I always look at her as the person that instilled the values in our family. She was the, the, the anchor. The anchor, so to Your speak. Your father was a worker. Yeah. A brother and sisters? I have one brother, uh, four sisters, and uh, we're very fortunate that we're all in the area. So pretty tightly knit family. Uh, I visit my parents once a week and try to spend time with them now as they're older. Mm. And what does your father do now that he's... He's retired, but he, he keeps himself busy. Um, he's always been attracted to the farm life, so he has little farm animals. and wakes up every morning, feeds the chickens, and stuff like that. It's, it's what he grew up around, and it's what he loves. Did you, did you work the fields yourself as a young man? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Uh, as a very young child, my father would take me with him to the fields, but I think it was mostly out of child care. You know, like there, would, there were no daycare centers, and so he'd wake me up in the morning, and we'd get on the tractor, and I'd go out there, and probably some of the dearest memories I have is spending time with my father while he was working. Um, did, you, did you live on the fields? Uh, yeah, we, in California, um, they provided housing for him, and so we lived very near the fields, and uh, it, was, it was almost like playing, like you're out in the fields and you'd pick strawberries, and it wasn't like forced labor, you, you were happy to be there. I was happy to be with my father. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. So your father was a bracero. Yes. He came over with a bracero program. Yes. Yeah. For years, he worked here in El Paso in construction, but it was always a, a love of farming that he was attracted to, and so eventually, mm -hmm. uh, California was the place to go. And his birthplace is where? He was born in a little town in Chihuahua called Satebo, uh, just south between Chihuahua and Parral. Okay. okay. And your mother? My mother is from Delicias, okay. and so they're both from the Chihuahua State region. Did they meet there or over here? They met in Chihuahua City, and okay. then uh, moved to Juarez, and then eventually El Paso in California. Are you the oldest middle? Yes, yes I, am. Okay. yes I am. Okay. And so, so your father picked in the fields, and, and you were with him, and then after that? Uh, we were there until I was uh, practically a teenager, and then at some point, um, he started to think about his father, my grandfather, and caring for him, who was still in Chihuahua. So he felt like it was better to be closer to the border region and decided to move back in El Paso, to El Paso. 
for a while, we lived uh, in La Union uh, so that he could work the fields there, and we picked onions and chilies and stuff like that in that area. So you started school then in, in the Oxnard area? Yeah. Mesa Union Elementary School is where I went to school in California. And then when I came here, I went to school uh, at Irvine High School. Were you English speaking when you started school? No. No, I was not. And yeah, I kind of I kind of remember like going to school for the first time. And the first thing they, they taught you was to ask permission to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so yeah, uh, but I learned English in school. Was it hard? I didn't find it difficult. No, okay. I thought, I think it was, it, it was a very conducive environment for learning, so. Was it mixed uh, farm working kids and non farm working kids and uh, city residents? In, in mostly farming. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was a farming region and stuff, and so uh, you saw a lot of that. Okay. But, okay. you know, back then you don't, you don't think of like the differences in people's occupation or status. I don't think that I ever looked at it like that. So you come back to El Paso? Yes. And you went to school here then? Yes, I Which did. Which school did you go to? I went to high school at Irvine High School. Okay. And then my father started working construction. Just couldn't make a living in the fields. Yeah. So he did, he did heavy construction. Yeah, and uh, very hard work. Um, and, um, you know, he'd work two jobs. Sometimes he picked up part-time work as a dishwasher and then started doing lawn work on the weekends. Um, always been a very hardworking man. And, you know, it's a tough situation when you come from Mexico looking for work and he has a sixth grade education. And he's a smart man, but not an educated man. And the good thing is that he, he provided for his family through his hard work. And, and you helped him uh, with his business as you were going to school? So um, my parents always focused on education. And like I told you, I think my, my mother was the anchor that instilled the values in us. And it was always about an education to better yourself. And so they made sacrifices so that we could go to school. And um, then when I came back and he was older, then it was like, OK, maybe I can help you. And so I worked with him for several years. So you learned construction. Yeah, yeah, I worked construction. and. It was always very satisfying to know that you could build something and your hard work would have some fruition. And so you finished high school at Irvine. Yes, and, and then? I went to school at A&M, and then um, my, my brother followed me there, and my brother graduated from A&M. I did not, but um, I came to work for my father, and, and I think that we probably made the right choice. So why A&M? That's a good question. I think a lot of times, um, there's a lack of guidance and you're not really sure where to go or what to do and um, maybe it's reputation maybe it's what you hear but you know you have no one to counsel you um, I probably sh would have been better off staying here at UTEP it wouldn't have been such a culture shock for me okay there was culture shock when you went to a and for sure yeah for sure yeah uh, it's so a great it's a great university and yeah. like I said it's and, and there's always programs for, you know, Hispanics and stuff, but at some point you still feel a little bit like the outsider. And El Paso has this unique situation where Hispanics are the majority, and yeah. it's, it's a more comfortable environment for me. But your brother did finish. Yes. What did fi area did he finish? He uh, got a computer science degree, and he's in law enforcement now. Okay. And your sisters, did they go to school? My sisters did go to school. I have a sister who had a, an accounting degree, and then I have two sisters, um, their housewives, and one that's a teacher. So your parents really did push education. Yeah, yeah. What was your mother like? My mother was always about, like, teaching us how to be good people, how to respect your elders, how to work hard, how to be honest. Um, so everything that I, I remember about our values was instilled in us by my mother. And your father just a hard my worker? My father's a hard worker, but it's, it's interesting. It's like he would take the boys aside and teach them how to be good men right. and how to respect women and how to work hard. And so very traditional old school Mexicanos. You got to remember um, both of them were, were elementary school educated. But you have both your parents. Yes, I'm very fortunate. They come from good stock, so 
my father's 82 and my mother's 81, and they're both active and strong, and yeah, I, I, I cherish that very much. So El Paso's been good to you. Yes, I think it's, it's been great. I think it can serve as an example for other places as to uh, immigrant communities, I think, you know. So where did you <coughs> then uh, pick up a social conscience or environmental conscience like you? Um, I'd, have to, I'd have to say that honestly it was our school systems and kind of making us aware that we have a responsibility to more than just making a living and kind of being socially responsible. So I, I, I believe in education and I believe in supporting you know, EPISD, EPCC, UTEP. I think all of us should give back to those educational institutions. So, so what year did you start your, your business? Um, my bike shop I started in 1995, November of 95. Did you have a business before that? No, um, no business background. Quite honestly, probably not the best way to get into business. I got into it because of my passion for cycling, but then I went back to school at UTEP and started taking business classes to understand how to run a business, the finance uh, aspect of it, the accounting aspect of it. So um, I wouldn't necessarily encourage people to start a business the way I did, which was very by the seat of your pants. <laughs> so you started the business before you went back to school to learn <coughs> yes. about business. Yeah, I think um, <coughs> once I was in it and um, survival was, you know, questionable, it was necessary for me to go back and say, hey, I need to learn about this. Did it help you? Absolutely. Absolutely. It makes you aware of things that you have to pay attention to. So when you started, did you have to borrow money or? So I, I'd been working with my father for a while and I knew at some point that he would retire and I had saved up money and quite honestly, not very much money. But um, I started the business with $25,000 and I went into it thinking, okay, if I lose this $25,000 and it goes south, what's the worst that's gonna happen here? Well, I go back to working construction. And so it was a, a gamble and not a very calculated gamble, but um, like I said, I think it was dra driven by my passion for cycling. So, so you started the business with, with, with savings, but you've been working with your father how many years? About 10 years. Wow, yeah. So you said, yeah. okay. But then you decided uh, that... I just didn't think that I wanted, so I was about 34, 35 at the time, and I thought, you know, I don't want to be here when I'm 55. And so I kind of looked to the future and, and said, okay, what do you want to do? I want to do something that drives me every day. And, and it's really important to love what you do because there's some days you don't want to go to work. <laughs> <laughs> and unless you love what you're doing, um, you've got to figure out what drives you. And, and certainly, I don't think that financial reward is the best incentive. You know, for some people it may be, it, 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 it's not what drives me. How do you come to that? To, to what drives you? And you know, I, I think it's a lot of introspection and looking at your life and going, you know, what do I really love? And what gives me happiness? And, and that's the thing about the bicycle that it's, uh, you get on the bicycle and you forget your worries and there's a certain freedom to it. Besides, um, the physical benefits and the positive environmental impact, I think there's something about the bicycle that's good for your soul. <laughs> so, so you, <clears throat> but you know, I had a bicycle, I loved bicycles mm -hmm. when I was a kid, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't uh, popular to keep a bicycle. I mean, I parked it and I didn't ride it again, even though I, I missed it. But you kept the bicycle, you enjoyed it. Yeah, and it's really interesting to me because a lot of times people who, who rode bic bicycles as children as children maybe gave it up and then if you get them back on it it's interesting that it brings it takes them back to being a child and it, it, it <laughs> brings back positive feelings um, so I still believe that the bicycle is the answer to a lot of the world's problems and you know I've recently looked at studies where uh, cycling is shrinking because more people are spending time in technology indoors Quite honestly, our obesity rates get to the point where it's not even fun to ride a bike because you have to have a certain level of fitness. But once you get back on it, it I, think, I think there's a way that you can find that passion for it. 
Yeah, I know I have, I have a, my oldest son rides, uh, uh, rides a bike and, you know, he does these 200 mile bike rides in Northern California. Mm -hmm. So he, he found a freedom in, <laughs> in riding bikes. But of course in the California hills, it's beautiful. It's beautiful here, you know, you can find beauty on a bike anywhere because you're right involved in, in, in the environment that you're in. And, and probably the most satisfying thing for me is when I've had people come into the shop while I'm very, very busy and they just duck their head in and maybe I haven't seen them in a couple months and they'll just thank me for the bike because it's changed their life in a positive way. Well, you know, when we were kids, uh, you know, we'd go to Western Auto, I guess, to get mm -hmm. bicycles or Sears mm -hmm. or the, the Schwinn bikes. I rode a Western Flyer, mm -hmm. I rode a Schwinn, yeah. But, but you got serious. When you got into bikes, it was already getting to be where there were bike manufacturers besides those regular brands, right? Yeah, the, you know, I love cycling. I'm not so much, I'm not so in love with the cycling industry or the business end of it because it is about business and it is about growth and margin and, and competition. And what I try to stay focused on is the bike end of the bike business. But but certainly, you know, the, it's it's a changing business environment with the internet and online sales and all sorts of challenges that every business faces. So you start your business um, with your savings. Mm -hmm. uh, what'd you do, get a storefront right away? Yeah, um, like I said, I don't think I knew what I was doing. I got a small little space, paid $700 a month, and um, I, it, it, I go back and I see some of that and I think, God, how did we ever make it? But somehow we did. I'm not sure exactly Where was how. that for a show? Um, it was right next to the rib hut in a 700 uh, square foot space that uh, had an ice cream shop next to it. Uh, on, on Mesa and on Cincinnati? On North Mesa, yeah, near the, in the Cincinnati University. I felt like it was necessary to have a bike shop near UTEP okay. because we could serve the student community there. So. How many bikes did you buy for stock at the beginning? That's kind of a funny story because um, I tried to buy bicycles from vendors, but because I had no history, no one would open an account for me. And I had a friend who owned a bike shop in the Santa Fe area, and in the winter he would sell skis. So opening up in November, I bought all his summer inventory uh. and brought it down to El Paso, and that's how we stayed in business our first year. Wow. So I really actually didn't, like I said, not necessarily the way I would recommend opening a business. I think that it's better to sit there and, and write a business plan and be properly prepared. Um, I did it by the seat of my pants and I was very, very lucky. Well, tell me, how did it, how did it start and grow? So as I said, I bought those bikes from a friend up in uh, Santa Fe and brought them down here and we focused on service. You know, we focused on earning a customer's loyalty. And, and so if I saw somebody unloading a bike in the parking lot, I'd go help them and, and bring it in. And I helped them pump up their tires. And we worked really hard at, at making an impression with our service because we didn't have the ideal retail presentation. Um, and now we try to balance that with outstanding service and, and great product. So how long were you in that first store? Two years. We were there two years, and then I moved across the street into a slightly bigger location where I was there for another 16 years. So after the first two years, now you started, now, now you were beginning to have a business. Yeah, we, we developed a very loyal following through community engagement. I'm a very big believer in reaching out to people who don't ride bikes and uh, exposing them to the many benefits of cycling. So we did beginner rides. We did a lot of trips where we would invite people to join us on mountain bike trips and road trips. And so um, by being focused on the community, I think we've built relationships that have lasted, you know, 20 years. What, what do you mean by the community? What, what are you talking about? Well, um, it's interesting that when we first opened up, there was an avid cycling enthusiast community, but it was a very small community and we expanded that to reach out to people who maybe never rode bicycles before. And it was um, students at UTEP who we developed relations. I, I have friends who I met them as students at UTEP and never rode bikes and now they're doctors and it's now, and, and cycling is a part of their lives. And so those bonds with the community I think is what has helped our business. 
So your first two years, you find that you have success. You move to a larger space, and you start hiring more people, I guess. Yeah, you know, for a long, long time, it was um, me and a good friend of mine who opened the shop, uh, a gentleman named Michael Griggs. And then he got married and moved to San Francisco, and then I s had to start hiring people. And that is a whole new challenge. But I've been very fortunate to find people who are committed to cycling as much as I am and who have been with me 15, 16 years. So as you were growing the business, did you have some, some support, some help from other business people or? We always tried to develop relationships with other businesses that, that work together. Um, so absolutely, you know, I, I had friends who had restaurants and we would do rides to their restaurant and try to promote their business so that there would be, you know, some commingling of, of, our, of our customers. So when you organize a ride, how many people do you take with you? Oh God, in the beginning it would be two or three and I've been on rides where we've had 50, 60 riders coming along, and it's, it's really rewarding to see, you know, how that has grown. I walk Scenic Drive on, um, on Sundays, and, and uh, there's always uh, troops of, of, uh, of, of bicyclists with their uh, crazy cat uh, shirts. Yeah, I think that's great that the city has been able to, to provide us with a place to exercise and walk and jog and ride. And quite honestly, um, there's still a lot of improvement that the city could do in promoting that lifestyle. Um, at some point, I would hope, I know that we have a sustainability expert at, at uh, City Hall. I would love to see some sort of cycling czar or health czar that promotes uh, a sustainable health plan for the whole city. So, um, when you started your cyclery, were you already socially conscious? Yeah, I like to think that I've, I've always felt the responsibility to have, um, I, I, I love the idea of a simple life. I'm attracted to the simplicity of the bicycle. I don't believe in consumption. I don't believe in extravagance. And um, it's one thing that I always talk to my employees about. I've never promise them wealth or riches, but uh, a satisfying um, job opportunity where they can feel like they make a difference. Well, that's part of, that's part, that's part of your culture then of your business to really make a difference. Yeah, I believe so because like I said, I think it is the answer to a lot of our problems. All you have to do is, uh, is drive on Mesa and see or you know, on the east side and see the congestion. And if we could just cut back on cars a little and increase bike lanes, I think that we would be able to solve a lot of our problems. So you have, now you have three stores. Yes, sir. Uh, your main, now you opened up, a, a, you were in that one place on Mesa for 16 years, you said. That was my original location at, on Mesa in Cincinnati. And we've moved two blocks over to Stanton in Baltimore. And it's kind of our dream location in that um, it's a great location for people to come and stay. Um, I have a fitness facility upstairs where people can exercise and train for events, whether it's half Ironmans or running events or cycling events. And so the goal is to have a wellness center where the community can come and congregate and talk about the different events that we can participate in or the different goals and make a difference in people's health. <clears throat> and you have two other stores. Yeah, I have a store out on Red Road um, and that's a great place to go out mountain biking because it's close to the trails off of Red Road. And then a uh, centralized location uh, here uh, near the airport. And um, that really promotes a lot of urban cycling, commuting, <laughs> Um, because I think people lose sight of the fact that there are a lot of people out there that don't own cars and they use a bicycle to get to work and I think we need to promote that even more. So what are you doing now to promote cycling? Um, we have initiatives in place to engage the community even more 
by uh, exposing them to the different types of cycling um, because there's more than just one bicycle. There's just so many different types of bicycles that uh, can connect to the diverse community that we have. So how, how did your family, uh, your brother and sisters, take and your parents to the fact that you opened up a cyclery? That's, a, that's an interesting question because um, my father being a very down-to-earth practical man um, knew that we were having some success in construction and for me to open a bike shop um, I really wondered whether he thought it was a childish sort of move and what are you doing thinking about selling bicycles and so I'm sure he had some doubts but he had enough respect for me to let me do what I thought was best and I think that he likes the idea of what we've established, you know. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a jump to go from farm worker to construction to cyclery. That, mm -hmm. that, that, that's a jump. Yeah, it, and I think sometimes it's out of necessity. You know, the fact of the matter that a lot of, the, a, a lot of our success has been because your back is up against the wall and you've got to figure out a way to survive. So when my father was raising you know, six children trying to make a living on the farms. It got to a point where, hey, this isn't going to work, and I've got to find something else. And so I think it's a lot. Of, a lot of times, it is out of necessity, and you've got to go out there and figure it out somehow. So you weren't afraid of trying to figure it out when you started. You no, know, I think what you've got to do is have faith in in the fact that you're willing to work hard. And that was like a value that my father had instilled in me. If you're willing to work hard and be frugal and not extravagant and, and uh, live within your means, very basic values that I still believe in. And, and, and sometimes I feel like we lose sight of those. So is it fair to say that maybe you're not too far from the farm still? Yeah, I, I, I'd like to think that because, you know, it's, I, I, I feel drawn to it. And as I get closer and closer to you know, 65 and start considering retirement, I don't want to ever stop working, but I like the idea of maybe going back and doing things that are farm related just for my own satisfaction. So this business idea is something you've really enjoyed. Yeah, um, it's given me a great deal of satisfaction and although it consumes me, I'm very proud of it and it was the right thing for me, yeah. I, I've been very satisfied. With you're that. happy where you're at. I'm very happy with where I'm at. Financially, you know, people can't sit there and measure our success by uh, how much money I take home, but um, we certainly sit there and look at the impact that we have and how we've grown this uh, cycling community, and we're very proud of that. Well, fantastic. We're, we're continuing a discussion with Mr. Roberto Barrio, who owns uh, Crazy Cat Cyclery. So why did you name your business Crazy Cat Cyclery? That's an interesting question. Um, as I remember it, um, we had decided to open up a location and I wanted to name it so that it had a connection to El Paso. And I wanted to name it like for a landmark or something that people could relate to. And so I had a good friend of mine that was a geology major at UTEP, and he had told me about the struggle to keep Crazy Cat Mountain from being developed, and how that was named after a mountain lion that would sometimes come down from uh, the Franklin Mountains into the El Paso community for water during the droughts or whatever. And I thought there was an environmental aspect to that. And so um, my friend, Mo Gibran, um, suggested that we name it after that mountain. And because we did a lot of our mountain biking behind there, I thought it was really appropriate. So uh, Crazy Cat Mountain became Crazy Cat Cyclery for our bike shop. That's interesting. Yeah, no, I know, I didn't know it as Crazy Cat <coughs> um, until until later, but <coughs> that's that's kind of a, a mountain between Mount Franklin and, and, and uh, toward, toward, toward UTEP, but it's right next there. And there's a canyon between the two mountains. Now it's developed and there's houses up there. Right. But before it was just a canyon. Right. And there's still mountain bike trails there. And uh, some of them are part of uh, Franklin Mountain State Park. Okay. Uh, but um, that definitely was our focus. And then trying to establish a, commu a 
connection to the UTEP community and us being in the neighborhood, we felt that that was, uh, could be um, sort of like the lightning rod for, for sure. our shop. Crazy Cat, I guess the trails run from Robinson up towards Stanton in the... Uh, yeah, they run all the way up towards Stanton on the other end, and they're really difficult trails, and uh, probably not where I would encourage beginners to start. We do some riding in Arroyo Park, uh, Billy Rogers Park, yeah. and there's... Uh, we're very fortunate in that we have fantastic trails that maybe not a lot of people know about, so Franklin Mountain State Park is a great place to ride mountain bikes. We have some great uh, riding out in the Northeast. And although road riding may seem dangerous, I think it's as safe as anywhere else in the country as long as you figure out the right times and places to ride. Well, road bike, uh, trail riding is different than road riding? Yes, absolutely. You yeah. use different tires? Yeah, different tires, different bicycles. Um, you don't have to deal with cars. You don't have to um, deal with the rules of the road, and that's one of the things that's really, really important. And one of the responsibilities that we have as being road cyclist is to follow um, the rules of the road just like any other vehicle. Well, you're, you're, you know, here you are, you, you, you come from a farm worker background. Mm -hmm. your, your father was a farm worker. You work the fields. Uh, you come, you know, you finish high school in El Paso, and you work with your dad in construction, and you decide you want to get into cycling because you always like cycling, but you want to start a business. Yeah, and, and like I said, I think it's because I believed in what cycling I is capable of. You know, I think I believed in that, hey, this can make things better and so that you can make a difference. And so um, certainly I've seen the health benefits of it. And like I said, I think there's plenty of environment, environmental benefits, but I think it's also the values that it stands for. You so, know. so you started in about '95, right? Yes, sir. November of '95. Were there other other bike bike shops? Yeah, yeah. Um, there were. We were the smallest bike shop, probably. I, I've heard stories of other friends who walked in the first time and walked into our bike shop and kind of felt sorry for us. They're like, they're probably not going to make it. And if I had walked into uh, our bike shop in year one or year two, I would probably have agreed. You know, it was it was a difficult time because you were trying to f figure it out. Well, I mean, it's a big jump. When I used to look at bikes, they were eighty-nine dollars or something like that. And, uh, but all of a sudden, you open a shop. You sell bicycles, uh, serious bicycles. Yeah, the, we have bicycles for bicycle enthusiasts, but it, it's not the price that differentiates the bike. Uh, I, I like to think that I have respect for all bicycles, and on occasion, I'll see someone who has a bicycle and they load it up with stuff that they've salvaged, and maybe they're taking it to Juarez, and I have as much respect for that gentleman as any um, cat, cat One racer, you know, because he rides his bike every day and makes a living at it, and so um, it's not the price of the bike that, that, that gives it value. You know, there are cycling enthusiasts who want the most advanced technologies, but one of my favorite bikes is just the simplest bike there is, which is a fixed gear, single speed bike that's just fun to ride. Yeah, yeah. I've seen those. The, so, so the range of, of uh, I guess, I guess prices for those things. Uh, how how strong do some of those bikes get? I those? think I think um, the variety of bicycles is diverse as as our community. You know, there are people who um, are in need of hundred, two hundred dollar bicycles that they need for um, to get to work, and then there are the people who want to have the BMW of bikes or whatever. And so um, we carry um, some of the top manufacturers in the country, and they offer us just about anything that's available in the bicycle industry. So the high end, what is a is a top bike run. So um, one of the things that's really becoming very popular and I'm very excited about right now are electric assist bikes. Um, they're very big in Europe, in Asia, and Australia. I think in the U.S. they've struggled a bit because we're more of a car culture, but I see as we're getting older and baby boomers want to continue to ride, they need a little assistance and electric bikes are um, a category of bikes that I have um, a lot that has a lot of potential and so they start at about 2500 although you can get them on the internet for like 1500 
Um, I think there's going to be a shakedown in the quality of some of the bikes, and some of them are no longer, may, you know, they may go by the side and not exist a year from now, but the really quality bikes are here to stay. So the electric assist is, uh, is, is that, is, is, as you pedal, you build up? Uh so it makes you pedal and it amplifies your effort. So if you put 10 watts of power, it gives you 20. And as we get older and we see a big hill, maybe that hill is not doable anymore. And the electric assist bikes helps us to do it. And so you get your exercise and you're able to get out there and do the things that you were able to do when you were younger. There's all sorts of technology that is being developed. And quite honestly, I wish it would slow down, you know, because I, I think I'm more attuned to a slower pace. But capitalism is about competition. Competition is about innovation. And so sometimes the pace is a lot faster than what I'm comfortable with. But um, I don't lose sight of what the bike is, which is basically a very simple machine, you know, that needs a human to power it. So you 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 have uh, I, I know they get into with innovation some of these very light bikes uh, and I and I guess I've heard I've heard people pay a lot of money for some of these bikes. Uh, you have found a market for some of that here in El Paso. Yeah, it, it's interesting. There's certainly you know carbon fiber technology out there, and and what happens is a lot of times you've got a guy who hasn't ridden a bike since he was a child, and comes in and starts with a very basic bike and realizes you know what this enhances my life and I want something better. And they come in and buy a second and a third bike and all of a sudden you kind of want the bells and whistles and you want something that's lighter and faster and um, that, m that enhances the experience. So there's a huge range of bikes, very wide variety. And, and, and so you have three stores. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in, in your stores, what kind of number, number of bikes, what kind of stock do you carry? Inventory management is something that I've had to learn, and uh, that has been one of the challenges of, um, of running our business, because in the beginning, maybe I had no comprehension of what inventory management meant. And as I realized that you know, it's important for us to pay attention to that to succeed, it's become a bigger focus. So our focus is always to try to have about 90 days of inventory in stock. So we'll have three or 400 bikes in stock at each location, sometimes in back stock, yeah. Wow, <coughs> that's pretty significant. You have to have a lot of space. Yeah, and we, we, we uh, stock in a warehouse so that oh, okay. we can restock the stores. Okay. So that we're not paying retail sp uh, pricing for warehousing. I, I was sharing with you uh, when I went by your store um, that uh, because my, my son is a rider, uh, he went to, s we had to cross the bay to go to San Francisco mm -hmm. to get his bike fitted. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is that? So one of the really important parts of owning a bicycle is making sure that you're comfortable on the bicycle. If you're not, you're not going to ride it. And for people who are very serious about their cycling, the fit of the bicycle is imperative for maximum performance. So basically what it has to do with is not the size of the bicycle is the first step, but after we pick the right size bike, it's important to properly fit it so that you're comfortable on it and you're generating the most power and you can ride it longer so that you enjoy it. So a proper fit is uh, imperative into having a positive experience. So we train, we have uh, specifically trained uh, people that uh, do 3D motion capture fits on a bike where we'll videotape the rider and make sure that he's in the correct position. Wow, <coughs> so that, that talks about the knees and the stance and all of Saddle that. Saddle height, uh, fore and aft position, proper extension, proper center of gravity placement so that the handling of a bike is optimized. Uh, it There's a, a, a biomechanical aspect to it so that uh, your knees are tracking properly and they don't cause pain, so you don't have issues with your neck, your back. Uh, we've got to pay attention to those things so that people don't feel pain when they ride. I mean, if you're feeling pain when you're riding, there's something wrong, and we've got to address that. You're pretty serious about it. Well, you've been at it for 20 years. <laughs> yeah, 20 years. I mean, there's, there's a lot of aspects to it that I think are, are very important that people don't don't pay attention to and it's important for us to help 
educate them and, and show them, hey, we can make your writing experience better by mm -hmm. enhancing your fit. And so, so yeah. So you're an expert in cycling. How about business? Are you an expert in business? Absolutely not. And it's something that, that I've gotten much better at. And um, there are so many people that are better business people than I am. I think what's driven our success is my passion for cycling, but I've had to learn business. And one of the interesting things, you know, I've, I've, I've learned is that there's, there's two approaches, I think, to, to, um, to running a good business, and, and you've got to balance them. One is the analytic side of it, and the other is the holistic side. And by that I mean the analytic side, you pay attention to your gross sales, your margin, your inventory levels, all the numbers, your payroll, and then there's the holistic side where it's like, what is it that I'm doing with this business and how is it making a difference and how does it impact my employees? So I've been in situations where business is down and my payroll is high. And if all I'm gonna pay attention to is the analytic side, then I'm gonna be sending people home, but then how are they gonna make a living? So you have to balance that and say, you know what? I don't care if my payroll's a little high, as long as we can get through this time, I want this employee because he's a valuable employee to stay here. And so um, I think it's easy to learn the analytic side, but learning to balance the holistic and the analytic together is, is something that you have to do by actually being in there. Where did you learn that? Um, through mileage. Mileage and being in the shop and just being there every day and realizing, hey, um, there's more to it than just the numbers. Um, there have been many, many situations where I've lost money on a sale just to make the customer happy. And it's important in building those relationships. So analytically, maybe it didn't make sense, but holistically it did because you build a relationship that you know this guy will come back. Have you had difficult customers? Oh, of course. And, 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 and difficult employees, and I've probably been a difficult difficult employer you know it's it's never every day is a challenge and every day you go in and um, you're going to have a problem and you're having to push through it and solve it and move on so it, it's never easy um, but if you love what you're doing I think you're able to get through it do you love facing the problems that come up it's interesting that if if I were to think about it initially, I would say no, but I think I like the problem solving. So you're faced with a problem and you're not happy about it, but then you're challenged in finding a solution to it. And so the problem solving is certainly uh, a rewarding aspect to it. So at the end of the day, you solve problems. Yeah, every day, every day. Every day. So is that what drives you to work every day? I think what drives me to work is knowing that there's going to be a problem and that we've got to find a solution. <laughs> yes. So, so you ju you just you just you just stick your nose to the wind and and go at it. Absolutely. Is that the, what it is to run a business? Absolutely. I think what you got to do is you got to put your head down and you got to push through. And uh, there's always challenges. So, in terms of of structuring your business and 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 you know, finding that, that, that balance. Where'd you get help? Where, where'd you find some support? I find that the most valuable asset of my business is my employees. And it is probably the source of the majority of my complaints in that we're always gonna complain about our employees, but they're also what drives the business and instilling values in them and having them feel a sense of ownership in the business is critical. Um, I couldn't do it by myself. And so you have to give them credit for the efforts that they make. And it's a challenge um, every day. I went to work today and one of my employees didn't show up because he was sick. And I can complain about it, but I can also understand that people get sick. You know, So we'll just be short staffed today. Yes, so there's, they're, they're the most valuable asset that we have and they have to be nurtured. And I try very hard to find good employees, reward them, keep them with me, mm -hmm. so that we're in this for the long haul and they can look at this as a career. So how do, how do you build that, that employee uh, loyalty? Uh, you look for values similar to yours so that they believe 
in what you believe in. And, you know, then it's like we're working on this together. And um, I like to, I have a very strong bond with my blood family, but I do as well with my employees. So I, I like to think that, you know, I, we've got a 401k retirement plan. We're looking to try to afford health care, which I wish we could get some more help on. Um, but I've got to give them a reason to stay. How many employees do you have now? 34. That's a lot of responsibility. Yeah, and I'd say that more than half of them have been with me for more than 10 years. Wow, you know, so they're not college kids. I have some college kids. That's how we would start mm -hmm. with college kids, and they move on to engineering jobs or teaching jobs. And, and I always wish them the best because, you know, that's the direction you want to go. Some of them have come back and realized, you know what? I, I found it more rewarding to be here with you. And so um, that's very satisfying. I value them very much. So as you, as you, as you grew your business, as you learned your business, uh, did you have big uh, external issues, uh, uh, like legal issues, uh, finance issues? I don't think I've ever had legal issues. Uh, finance issues, to this day, we still have them. Um, you know, you have to look at cash flow and make sure that you have cash when the season comes on. Um, I, I, I still think I have a lot of learning to do. I've kind of, over 20 years, have learned the cycle of when business is up and then when it comes down and preparing for it. You know, I look at November and I go, okay, here it comes. Brace yourself and let's get ready for this. Um, and you know, right now we're in the spring and we're so happy to, to have lots of traffic and seeing our friends back on their bikes. And so um, there's cycles to it. Um, I've been fortunate not to have legal issues. I'd like to keep it that way. Um, certainly we have challenges. You know, for me, one of my biggest challenges right now is just like wrapping my mind around how much we're taxed and how much money goes to the government. And I look at it not just as my money, but it's my employees' money, and, and so it's a challenge. So what, what, what is for the future of Crazy Cat? You know, we have, we have some thoughts and some plans. It's, we have some dreams, you know. Um, ideally, I sometimes think about, remember how I told you there's the bike business and I like to focus on the bike end of it, although the business end of it is very important. I think about having this small little Italian like cafe, coffee shop, wine bar and that just sells very unique handmade bikes and uh, just kind of want to, wanting to go back to the simplicity of it. And so that, that would be uh, a nice little thing to, to end my, my career with, a nice little shop like that. So you have a dream. Did you start with a dream? Oh, absolutely. You know, it's like my dream was, and you see, when I'd been in college, I'd been to bike shops like in Houston and Dallas and Austin, and I remember one that was near Rice University. It's called Boone Cyclery, and they were in this little gentrified neighborhood, and it was a bike shop in a house, and that's kind of what I had wanted, and then sometimes survival dictates that you evolve, you evolve into more of a retail business, and you lose sight of the soulful part of it, and so reconnecting with the soul of cycling is is necessary for me to keep the drive going. So you're, you're, you're talking about a couple of things that are interesting. You're talking about the, the, um, the business side of business, mm -hmm. but you also have a passion for your business. And, and, and uh, while, you, while you have to manage the business and run a good business, you, you also are concerned about... I wouldn't be doing it without the passion side of it or the soulful side. And so every now and then what you've got to do is you've got to stop and reset and go, okay, I got my bills paid, took care of payroll, handled the business end, but why are we doing this? And, and, and what is it that drives us? And uh, quite honestly, sometimes um, I'm open to criticism that I get too involved on the business end of it and we lose sight of where we came from and connecting to that community. And, and bringing people in for the love of cycling. And so um, sometimes you have to refocus 
and go, well, don't forget why we do this, you know, why we're in this business. And so um, that's why I, I think about that small little Italian cafe and going, that would be the essence of what cycling is about. So you have a dream. So how, how would I translate that if I'm talking to a, a, a bu different kind of business? Not I can understand cycling because, mm -hmm. because you know, you have a passion for that. And uh, but some of these businesses may be, how do you get excited about certain kinds of things, plumbing or something like that? Well, you know, I think there's a reward in it. It's like, you know, say you love to cook and you open up a restaurant. And it's like, you know, I love cooking and I, I love to cook. I don't know if I could make a living at it, but I could see being passionate about that, you know, and running a restaurant. I've worked construction and construction is extremely satisfying to me where you start a project that's nothing and you work very hard at building something and then you're going through final inspections and you're going through the building and you're checking off on everything that's been done and you walk away from something that you've built. And I think you can find a great deal of pride in being a plumber or a carpenter or a roofer. I think, again, especially when you're contributing in some way and you feel that satisfaction. So, so where does profit motive fit? Profit motive for me is about just being to able to continue. Um, like I said, I believe in a simple life. I don't have a lot of needs. I think that I wish more people would think like that. It's not about consumption. It's not about more, more, more. It's about this is what I need. This is all I need. I'm fine. I'm happy. Um, and so I'm not necessarily driven by money, and I think it's a bad idea to always look at the bottom line and have that dictate to you. If the bottom line is going to dictate that I have to fire an employee or that I have to lay off an employee, I don't think that that's how I would want to do things, me personally. So Probably if bad business, though. <laughs> you know, I don't know But about you've that. survived. You've survived. Yeah. And people stay with you, and you have a loyal customer base. Yeah. So you're doing some things right. Yeah, I think it's sticking to the values that you have in your business. I think that if you wanted to be successful is to define those values and stick to them. And you've done that. I'd like to think that we're doing our very best to do that, yes. And as we've discussed, you have shared your values a little bit with us. Yes. Are there fundamental values that maybe we didn't talk about that, that we need to? Um, I like to instill in my employees this idea of owning up to your responsibilities and you know it's like the decisions you make get you where you're at and taking responsibility for that pretty simple stuff you know it's like that sometimes is lacking don't point the finger at someone else your failure is because of the choices you've made your success is because of the choices you've made so your employees really get a lesson in life you know, I have some employees who their children now are coming to work for me and, and I have connections to employees that have gone off to Austin and work and, and I have parents that have come to me like when their employees first came to me and, and kind of made a difference in their lives. I've had, a, you know, like young men that maybe were tagging walls and had to come to work for me or <laughs> go to jail or something, I don't know. So this whole idea of building a business, um, of course it's been satisfying for you, but but it, it's been more than that. You've found a fulfillment in building a business. Absolutely. You know, I, I can't see myself having worked this hard without having some sort of fulfillment because it has been all-consuming at times. You know, it's everything that my life revolves around, even like my vacations revolve around cycling, cycling trips to Utah or Austin or California. So uh, it has been all consuming and, and, and that's where I get the satisfaction. So you're consumed with cycling? Consumed with running, uh, yes, consumed with cycling, consumed with spreading the word 
about cycling and getting it out there. And, and like I said, I really believe it can make a huge difference. I think our lives would be better with more people on bikes. So your business is really a mission? It, it, it does have that purpose, yes. And in that sense, you're a missionary. <laughs> I don't know about that, but um, I, I believe in these core values and I try to spread that, yeah. So core values are very important to you. Absolutely, absolutely. It's I think that's the center, what centers us all. All of us have, have them at some point. So your core values help you balance the business side. So your, your, your business decisions are based on your core values? I, I, I would agree with you on that, yes. Okay. How I run my business really is dictated by the values that I have. And, and those, the values that I believe in. And yes. those come from, from your roots? From my roots, from my parents, from the simple people that they were. And I have much more respect for them than anyone who flaunts their wealth and thinks that that makes them better. I'm speaking to you, Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Mr. Buddy, it's been a wonderful story that you've shared with us. I've really thoroughly enjoyed that, and um, I, um, I have a, a deeper respect now for, for, for cycle, cycling because you have a certain, uh, uh, you, you espouse a, a, a freedom with cycling. Yeah. Uh, but you build a good business, and, and, and uh, I appreciate you sharing your business story Thank you. and, and your values. Uh, it's been a, a great story, and I, I really thank you for sharing your story, and I thank you viewers for watching this show, and, and trust you enjoyed uh, hearing Mr. Barrio talk about Crazy Cat Cyclery. You have a good day, and Mr. Barrio, thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're very kind. Thank you.